so that's a promise. Hey, Debbie. We have so much to be thankful for. We are so blessed. And we have a chance to return some of that blessing of praise to the author of our whether it's a good day, or a bad day, whether we're on the mountaintop, or in a valley, he is the author of all of our blessings. Praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his, suppressed, for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of a trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with That's the trombone, <laughs> praise him Birthday. and dancing, praise him with the strings and flutes. Praise him with the clash of cymbals, praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And I'd say praise the Lord by lifting your hands if you feel like doing it too. <laughs> We're going to start with blessed be your name.
thanksgiving for everything you do for me, and may the people around me see it and seek you.
continue to him, uphold him in prayer, and Lynn, too. It's been a struggle for her, as you can imagine. Uh, she tries to put on a brave face, but you can tell in her heart, her heart is broken. So let's uh, go to prayer this morning. Father, we come this morning, and, and certainly Jeff is on our hearts. And Lynn, too, and even Ian, as uh, they continue to watch. As Jeff continues to fight, Lord, give him your spirit of grace and comfort as he goes through this. Lord, we have prayed for and continue to ask, Lord, that you would divinely touch his body. We ask that you be with them. Bring him the strength and healing, we pray. In all things we glorify you, in all things we trust your divine and sovereign will, that you know what is best. Help us to find our courage and strength in you. Bless them today, we pray, as they continue to watch. Lord, there are so many people that we know who are, are not well. Many are not written in our bulletin. As a matter of fact, I, I don't think we have any list in there right now of people who are not well. But we can think of people. Lord, may your spirit of comfort be with them. Praise them to strength. Lord, I thank you this morning as we heard some of the wonderful things that uh, we do as Baptists in missions. And Lord, the, the pot of money is always short for the, the many needs around this world and many needs within our own very community as we think of reaching to this community. Thank you for what we do do. May you bless the work that we do uh, to proclaim the gospel Jesus Christ, whether it be by relief, or to handing up Bibles, or to sending missionaries, whatever it may be, may they bring glory to you. I think this morning again of our missionaries of the month, again, I, I don't know how to pronounce their names, so I will not butcher them, but uh, we just pray your blessing upon them as they serve you. Bless them, may their work be very fruitful. We thank, Lord, of our, our, our leaders in our country today, Lord, and we are called to pray for them, no matter what our political views may be, just that you would guide and direct them, we pray. Lord, they have jobs that are so thankless, and that have just opened up to so much criticism, uh, and many of us would never dream of trying to take on a role because of the criticism they take. Thank you that there are those willing to stand up and try and do good for our, for our country, for our communities. Be with them and bless them, we pray. We thank you for the word of God that is being proclaimed today around our community and right across the world. And we are grateful for everyone who preaches Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Bless the work that is being done today. May the family of God be blessed and encouraged into being in your, in your house. And may people come to know you through the preaching of the word this day. We thank you that we can open the word ourselves. And Lord, as we open it, may we find ways today to find healing when we are broken. To learn how to forgive so that we may be free indeed. So bless the words that I'm about to speak. All right, today we are looking at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. 
where Jesus teaches disciples on how to pray. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will, will reward you. And when you pray, do not use meaningless repeti repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not uh, be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you not forgive others, your Father will not forgive your transgressions. There. Last week I said we would begin a series on Easter. I was a week ahead of myself. I had spent the first two days working hard on my sermon for Sunday, and Sherry reminded me it's another week away, and I said, like, oh no. So I had to go back to the drawing board and start all over. Uh, but next week we will certainly look at the uh, triumphal entry, as it is so often called, uh, in regards to the uh, Easter story. You know, we have seen on the news over and over again uh, shootings in schools in the United States. It's been absolutely tra tragic to watch. I have, somebody posted on Facebook just read this week, a friend of mine, and I'm not sure if the statistics are accurate, but basically there has been more students killed in the, in the United States than there are people who were killed in, during the Afghanistan war. That's really <coughs> staggering to think about. And I know most of us are very proud Canadians and none of us that I think, I don't think anyways, would like to be an American. But I know all of us, certainly our hearts are breaking for them <coughs> because they watch this go through their system constantly. And it seems common sense to us on this side of the border to have some kind of gun control over this, this nonsense that goes on. An old friend of mine who uh, has been a friend of mine since uh, high school days, uh, who's not saved and uh, openly mocks uh, my faith, uh, even though he's still a friend, uh, complains on Facebook all the time about God not stopping evil in the world. And have you ever wondered about evil that happens in our lives? Why does it happen? Do you ever hurt so bad you can't help wondering is God, why God is allowing such things to happen? And the Bible says God works all things out for good. But when you think of that one event in your life perhaps, or as you see the shootings in the United States, you just can't seem to move forward. And life is very painful. Some people, and it's staggering to know how many people that actually this has happened to, have been molested as children. And they can't seem to move forward. We hear of people, not just uh, those in the military, but uh, uh, those who work in ambulances and other things in life who have suffered from PSD. PS PTSD and can't seem to move forward. And uh, there's so many things that just bombard our lives that at times we feel like we just can't move on. That event takes hold of our lives. And how is God working good out of all that? God will work everything out for good. But hear this. God doesn't make bad things good. What 
may have happened to any of us could indeed be very bad. We can't gloss it over. Good, uh, God's good thing is to show you how you can walk through your crisis and come out the other end as a better person. Does a promise to keep you from it. Things like abuse do happen. But you know what? When those things happen, it doesn't change your identity. And that's where so many people fall off the rails. I think there is somebody else that is not true. Nor does it change your standing with God. You are a child of God. Nor does it have, could, does it have to have control over your life. Uh, yes, sometimes... Um, we are sometimes victims of terrible tragedies, but if we only see ourselves as defined by that experience, we will never be able to move forward out of that tragedy. You are a child of God. You are very special to God. You are unique to God. You are sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit to the day of redemption. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and no one's able to open that book of life except Jesus himself. No event, no person, nothing good or bad that happens to us can change any of that. But we have to believe it. We have to believe God's word. I can't stress enough to you as of late how important it is to be reading your word every day. It is your source of strength. It is where you get the truth of who you are in Jesus Christ. So let me ask you a question that I believe is important. How has God planned for you to resolve past experiences? <coughs> I hope and pray over the course of this series you have begun to understand how precious, how absolutely precious we are in the sight of God. And I can only hope and pray that you have been internalizing some of the truths I have been teaching you. Because by now you should know and be able to answer the, uh, some of these difficult questions that come across in our lives. You have the privilege of evaluating your past experience on who you are now, not how, how you are when that experience happened. The intensity of the primary emotion was established by how you perceived that event at the time that it happened. Remember, I've already taught you this. Your emotions are a product of how you perceive the event, not the event itself. Refuse to believe that you are just the product of a past experience. Now as Christians, you are the product of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. You are literally a new creation in Jesus Christ. All things, including the travels of the past, can be behind us as we move forward. If we were able to put a scale of 1 to 10 out there, with 10 being the greatest, uh, people who have been damaged in the past have their emotions often stuck way up there at a 10. When a present event activity uh, activates that primary emotion, they believe that they what they feel inside instead of believing what is true by the Word of God. <coughs> Let me give you one little example. People who have been verbally abused by their parents. Parent kids are supposed to be uh, present but not heard kind of thing, or however that saying goes. Uh, and, and a lot of parents yell at the kids an awful lot. Uh, and I believe that it's, this is something many from us older generations have experienced more than the younger generations. Uh, many of our older parents didn't know how to communicate too well, and they did it by uh, raised voices. <laughs> and we end up believing that we are unlovable sometimes. God bless you if your parents were the kind and gentle kind. 
But something I've learned over the years that a lot of us have been yelled at an awful lot by our parents. And that's not the same. We shouldn't blame our parents for life's problems. But now you know who you are in Jesus Christ. Now you can look at those events from the perspective of who you are today. The truth is God is in your life now desiring to set you free from many of these hurts. As strange as it may sound, that is the gospel. The good news that Christ has come to set us free from these things that captivate us. We need to now look at these past hurts with new lenses on. We need to look at them now with our new identity in Jesus Christ, and that is a first step to healing from past hurts. Now the second tip to healing is a little more difficult for us, and the second step is you have to forgive those who hurt you. Now, well, some of us have been hurt rather deeply in life by some people, and you may be asking, how can I forgive so-and-so for the wrong they have done to me? Well, let me throw it, uh, throw it out in another way. Why should you forgive those who have hurt you? The first reason is very simple. In the text we read today, Matthew 6, verses 15 and 16 says, If you forgive men for their transgressions, your Father will forgive you also. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. We forgive because God requires us to forgive. I know this is hard to hear, but we must base our relationship with others on the same criteria on which God bases his relationship with us. And his relationship with us is founded on love and acceptance and forgiveness. <clears throat> the second reason we need to forgive is because unforgiveness leads to entrapment by the evil one. Many counselors would tell you this is the number one thing that you, Satan uses uh, to gain entry into a believer's lives. Paul encouraged uh, Mutual for forgiveness, he said in 2 Corinthians 2.11, in order that no advantage be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. Holding on to those hurts and not forgiving somebody will control your life. You will be bitter. And you will feel less than special in God's eyes. Learn to forgive. And thirdly, we forgive because it should be a standard operating procedure for all Christians. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, Let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put from you, along with all malice, and be kind to one another, another tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. The story is told, and this is a true story, of a family whose uh, mother had died. She was elderly, and the, the children themselves were in their early 60s. And uh, the pastor was told that there were two executors for the will. And unfortunately, these two executors, brother and sister, were at odds with each other. And they had totally different ways of interpreting the will and what things should be done and, uh, and how to handle Paul's affairs. And unfortunately, it was a mess. And when talking to one of them, the brother, he said something to this effect. He said, well, this is kind of like a divorce with my sister, and I'm so glad when this will be over with, and I won't have to talk to her again. And that is so, so sad. So sad. Both of them, both of them claiming to be Christians, talking in such a way, I can't imagine how that hurts the Lord's heart when we consider what he did for them at Calvary. 
Sometimes when a pastor talks about a topic, I know I feel sometimes that it's going in one ear and out the other ear. And I've also felt like when I'm speaking, I don't know what, I have a clue what I'm saying. <laughs> I just feel, I feel lost. And I go out there and I think, well, what a mess this morning. And, and, and those are the times, and almost every single time when I feel like I've totally messed up, people say, that was a really good sermon. And I'm sitting there and I'm saying, oh, what a mess. God uses us really uniquely. There's a common misconception out there that some things are for pastors and missionaries and scholars to do, but for the rest of us, for the rest of you, you can't let go of that hurt or pain as if pastors and so forth don't ever go through difficult situations. That's okay for them, but not for us. Let me tell you a couple of things about being hurt. First thing, forgiveness doesn't mean forgetting. We can't forget what happened. We're human beings. It's there in our minds all the time. A lot of people say when we are forgiven in Christ Jesus that God has forgotten our sin. I've heard that preached so many times from Scripture, and there are some uh, passages that may support it. Talk about God puts your sin behind his back so he can't see it. Or God puts our sins as far as the east is from the west so he doesn't know our sin anymore. Um, I don't know if that's consistent in scripture. I tend to believe that God still remembers our sin. And I'll tell you why before you start throwing tomatoes at me. <laughs> God is omniscient. Omniscient simply means that God knows everything. He doesn't forget anything. So it makes logical sense to me that he literally does not forget our sin. But two, and here's the important thing, there's where his grace comes in. Somehow, he chooses not to remember it somehow. He chooses not to bring it to his mind. <clears throat> And he doesn't hold that sin against us. That is an act of his grace. And you ask me, how does that work? I have no idea. If you figure out how to explain the Trinity, come and explain that to me too. <laughs> there are two other things that I cannot explain. But I think because God doesn't forget, that is even more an extension of his grace and his forgiveness of us. For also, forgiveness doesn't mean that we need to tolerate sin. Forgiving someone doesn't mean you become their doormat and they continually to hurt you. Sometimes we have to lovingly conf confront people, and I know conf confrontation isn't fun. Churches today are allowing so much sin in the church in the name of love and grace, and we don't want to offend them. Uh, I had once uh, this fellow in our church he was, I don't know, 21, member of the church, and he did something. I'm not going to say what it was. And his mom came to me later on and says, if you bring him to church discipline, we're all leaving the church. Uh, not quite the way it should go. Uh, by the way, I had never even considered church discipline for him. It was just her own fears. She knew of the sin he was living in, and uh, she felt... I guess she felt it might be in order, but I wasn't there to do that. There's a fine line between love and loving confrontation. Forgiveness does not demand revenge. That's a hard one. Or even repayment. And so you may ask, am I supposed to let them off the hook? Yeah, you're supposed to. Ian Anderson says this one phrase that I thought was so profound. Let them off your hook, realizing that God doesn't let them off his hook. Interesting thought. Forgiveness means resolving to live with the consequences of somebody else's actions against you. The reality is you have to live with con uh, consequences of the offender's sin, whether you forgive them or not.
We need to expect positive results when we forgive. In time, you will be able to think about the people you offend without feeling hurt or anger or resentment. I want to share with you in closing 12 steps to forgiveness. Now, hang on, I know I said 12, and you're probably thinking, well, there's two or three more sermons to come, but I'm going to make it really quick here, okay? Uh, number one, and these are very practical things. Write down on a sheet of paper the names of the person who has offended you. Describe their offense in detail. Professional counselors will tell you that 95% of people's list will include their mom and dad. And some people are brave enough to even put God on their list. Even though God doesn't need forgiveness, we have sometimes false expectations of God and we need to come to Him. Second, face the hurt with, uh, face the hurt and hate. Write down how you feel about the hurt. Remember, having the emotions is not sin, but be honest, because there's no point in hiding it anyways. God knows how you're feeling. Three, acknowledge the significance of the cross of Jesus Christ. It is the cross of Christ that makes forgiveness legally and morally right. Jesus took upon himself the sins of the world, yours and mine, and he took on the sins of a person who may have hurt you. And he died once for all. Hebrews 10.10 10 says, Our hearts and minds may speak. It isn't fair. Or well, where is the justice? It's in the cross. And number four, decide you will bear the burden of each person's sin. This means you will not retaliate in the future. All true forgiveness is substitutionary as Christ's forgiveness was for us. And five, decide to forgive. This is hard. But forgiveness is a crisis of the will. Believe me, I've had to wrestle with this countless times in my life, and I know what I am talking about here. I really do. And six, take the list you made to God and pray and say, I forgive so and so, say their name for the list of their hurts that you will pray. And if you feel bitter toward that person for some time, you may want to start believing God's word as to who you are and your significance in Jesus and their significance in Christ as well and pray for them. Pray that God will bless them. Seven, take that list, put it in your fireplace. Now you're free. Don't tell the person who hurts you. That may not be appropriate. Forgiveness is between you and God. Allow God to give you the healing. Number eight, this one is hard. Don't expect changes on the other person's part. That's a hard one. Pray for them. Keep praying God's blessing upon them. Number nine, try to understand the person who you have now forgiven. Believe it or not, they have been victims in life too. Usually those who are really hard on you are people who have had many, many issues themselves. And number ten, expect positive results in your life. In time, that's important. Time heals wounds. And 11, thank God for the lessons you have learned and the maturity you are now receiving in your experience of uh, healing. And finally, be sure to accept your part of the blame. Confess your failure to God and understand that if someone has something against you, you must go to that person. Offering forgiveness frees us. When you're holding on to things, we are the ones who hurt. I remember at seminary, uh, one of my professors, Dr. Timothy Ashley, used to say to us, you'd be surprised how frequent in the morning people actually think of you. He says, when they wake up in the morning, they're not even thinking of you. <laughs> you know? 
uh, they're not thinking, boy, how can I make so-and-so's life miserable today? We may even be shocked how little they think of us. And in a crowd this size, it wouldn't be unusual that, the, uh, that for sure some people are holding on to some hurts. And why not take some of these steps this morning and experience the forgiveness God has for you as you forgive others. Let's pray. Father, I know forgiveness is a very difficult thing. And I just pray for all of us today, Lord, that uh, it's easy to love those who we love, as the scripture says, but it's a different ballgame when we consider other people. We ask, Lord, that you would help us be people of grace and love, and that we take some of our hurts that we have some this morning and bring them to the cross of Christ and allow you to restore our souls. Bless these words this morning, I pray for this thing. Amen. Our closing hymn, Take Time to Be Holy. Please stand.